So welcome um, everyone. My name is uh, Aaron Zwerko. I'm the Assistant Director for Planning and Community Development. Um, welcome to the informational forum on real estate transfer fees. Um, the uh, uh, Housing Plan Implementation Committee um, has, through um, the Select Board, has submitted an, a warrant article, Article Number Twenty Seven, to um, to propose a home rule petition for a real estate transfer fee. Um, I am uh, joined tonight by uh, Frank Rich Feely, um, who is the Concord Housing Foundation President. Um, he is also a retired faculty member at the Boston University School of Public Health. He has lived in Concord for over 20 years and is the president of the Concord Housing Foundation. The foundation is a private organization that works to raise awareness of affordable housing issues. Um, and over the last 20 years, it has raised approximately a million dollars in private funding that has been used for affordable housing projects in Concord. We are also joined by Hannah Carrillo. Hannah is the Sustainable Neighborhoods Coordinator for the City of Somerville, um, Somerville's Housing Division, and has been involved in transfer fee policy work since her arrival nearly four years ago to the area. Hannah was heavily involved in Somerville's transfer fee home rule petition process, which resulted in a unanimous City Council approval in 2018 and is now leading the Transfer Fee Coalition, um, a statewide group advocating for transfer fee enabling legislation in addition to the several home rule petitions that are now pending approval. And lastly, um, we are joined by Ellen Schachter, um, who currently serves as the director um, of the City of Somerville's Housing and uh, Office of Housing Stability. OHS's mission is um, both to assist tenants facing displacement and to pursue legislative, administrative, and programmatic policies aimed to promote housing stability in Somerville by increasing the supply of affordable housing and strengthening tenants' rights. Prior to coming to OHS, Ellen worked for 28 years as an attorney at the Cambridge and Somerville Legal Services, representing low-income families, tenant associations, and grassroots community organizations in housing, and public benefits matters. Um, she taught a course, uh, a housing clinic course at the BC School of Law and is a frequent trainer in the local and state forums on housing and tenant rights issues. Um, so we're, we're very lucky to have this group of panelists. Um, and I will also um, mention that we are joined by a number of the Housing Plan Implementation Committee members, um, members of the um, finance committee, the select board, um, town meeting members, and others. Um, thank you all for taking some time out tonight to join us and learn a little bit about Article 27. Um, so for the agenda tonight, I'm going to talk about the article a bit um, and give you an introduction to real estate transfer fees. Um, Rich will provide um, the perspective from Concord and their experience, and Hannah and Ellen will talk about um, Somerville's experience and um, legislation that's pending um, in the State House. Um, at the end of the evening, we'll do um, Q and A um, that will be moderated by me. Um, so, what is a real estate transfer fee? Um, it's a small fee assessed on the purchase price of um, residential and commercial real estate transactions. Um, it creates a renewing and sustainable funding source for affordable housing. This type of tool is used by 37 states, um, either statewide, by counties, and or by other jurisdictions within those states and the District of Columbia. Um, legislation has been submitted to establish a local option, but that does not exist as of today. Um, and a number of home rule petitions have been submitted by Boston, Brookline, Concord, Nantucket, Somerville, among others. Um, so Article 27 was um, originally submitted to the 2020 annual town meeting warrant. Um, it was deferred when um, the pandemic hit and um, it, the, there was a goal to streamline that annual town meeting. So at this point, we've um, the Ho Housing Plan Implementation Committee has resubmitted um, Article 27, which seeks town meeting approval to submit a home rule petition to establish a real estate transfer fee. 
It also seeks authorization to establish a fee on purchases that exceed the statewide median single family home sales price, which in 2020 was 445,500. Um, it also seeks authorization to establish a fee that ranges between 0.05% and 2%. Seeks authorization to establish a number of exemptions and all revenue that would be collected um, would be transferred to the Arlington Affordable Housing Trust Fund, which was adopted by the special town meeting this past November. Um, so this is a home rule petition because the local option does not exist as of yet. Um, so the home rule petition process is that town meeting will consider, um, consider approval to submit a home rule petition. If town meeting does approve that, the town would request the legislative delegation to file the home rule petition. Um, and then if the legislature approves during the current two year legislative session, um, the town would then um, be able to develop a bylaw. The bylaw would have to be adopted by town meeting and ultimately approved by the voters. Um, so this, this can be a lengthy process. The current legislative session is two years. Um, and then of course we would have to have it um, on a ballot for an upcoming election in Arlington. So, um, so this is just the first step in a long process. Um, and we see that there's opportunities throughout this process for public input. Um, so the relationship to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund is that it will create a sustainable and renewing funding source for the trust fund. Um, the funding could support the average cost of developing affordable housing, which often exceeds the local and state funding sources. The trust fund board of trustees would develop a five-year action plan through a public process that identifies goals and priorities and funding sources. Um, which could include um, community development block grant funds, um, Community Preservation Act funds, um, other, other funds and revenue sources that come into the town, such as through short-term rentals um, or marijuana establishments. Um, but the funding potential through a real estate transfer fee would um, enable a holistic and well-capitalized effort for the town to consider. And with that, I'm going to stop the share and um, ask Rich to provide a little bit of background um, about the Concord experience. Um, Concord in, um, in the recent years um, passed both a trust fund uh, bylaw and the real estate transfer fee petition as companion pieces. So it, it is um, quite similar to uh, what Arlington um, and what the Housing Plan Implementation Committee is um, looking forward to do. So with that, Rich, um, I'd welcome you to the conversation. Thank you very much, Erin. It's an honor to be here. <clears throat> I, this story starts about five years ago, although Concord has a long commitment to affordable housing going back, I think, to Thoreau's uh, cabin on Walden Pond. But uh, we do have a public housing authority. We have used PRD legislation and uh, tax credits to try and get uh, other affordable housing built in the town. But starting about five years ago, we all became concerned, or at least all the housing foundation, about the rate of teardowns of what had been the affordable housing stock in the market, uh, the smaller homes, mostly post-war. Uh, and with no uh, available land, these were being bought up, torn down, and uh, sold, you know, as 5,000 square foot um, houses for over a million dollars. So uh, one study that was recently done by the building department showed that of 188 new homes in the study period, 110 were teardowns. So we started out saying, what can we do to keep some of these in the stock so that people can afford to live in Concord without an IPO or a trust fund? Um, and we started with a, uh, the idea of a surcharge on building permit fee. And that came to town meeting in 2017, was somewhat controversial and lost by two votes uh, but uh, the select board substituted an amendment uh, that it said, okay, uh, we will appoint a committee 
to study a sustainable source uh, for affordable housing. That committee met for over a year and they came back and they basically said, you know, the only thing that's really gonna give us a sustainable st stream of real money is a transfer fee. And they are fully aware that transfer fees already exist, not only in other jurisdictions, as Aaron said, but here in Massachusetts, in Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard and Barnstable for preserving ocean open space. So the idea of taxing real estate transactions for public good is I think established. So uh, the select board actually came back with a recommendation um, to tax at 1% of value in excess of $600,000, which at that point was the median roughly uh, house sale price, you know, houses and condos together uh, in Concord. That passed and our estimate of revenue or my estimate uh, is that that would generate somewhere around a million dollars a year. Uh, if you want to compare that with other possible sources, 1% uh, on everything uh, would have generated without that $600,000 floor, generated about three and a half million. Uh, so, um, you know, it's a lot of money and as prices go up, it becomes more. That passed and we have now submitted our home rule petition two years in a row and it's gone nowhere. But I think the significant thing in Concord <clears throat> is that the select board took it seriously, appointed a committee that included affordable housing advocates, but real estate people as well. And they looked at a variety of ways to do it. And they said, you know, if we're gonna have a sustainable source of funding for affordable housing, the transfer fee is the way to go. They also, by the way, did uh, recommend that uh, the permit surcharge go ahead as well. But the big source of money would be the transfer fee. So that's kind of our history. We're now, uh, I mean, our legislators, Senator Barrett, Rep. Cabea are supportive, um, but you know the problem, as you might imagine, in the general court is going to be the real estate industry. But I, the more I work on this, and I've been working with Ellen and Anna on the uh, transfer fee coalition, uh, the more convinced I am, a that there has to be a regular source. This can't be, you know, something that comes out of real estate taxes at the local level or state uh, income and property taxes. And uh, it has to come out of a source that is related to the problem. And frankly, the escalation in real estate prices is part of the reason that we have such expensive housing and have such a high burden of housing costs. I was just looking at a Boston Foundation study and in Suffolk County alone, this is a 2019 study, over 50% of the households were paying more than 30% of income per housing. So, you know, if you think we've got a problem, the statistics prove it. So uh, that's where Concord is. Um, I have not yet been assaulted in the supermarket parking lot for advocating this. And I'm hopeful if we can get support in the legislature, we will implement it. And I think it'll be used in a variety of ways. We use it to help modernize the Concord Housing Authority properties. We'll use it to buy down units and new developments as they come up. And we'll also use it to try and buy some of these older, smaller houses before the developers get them, modernize them, and then, you know, sell them back at what a, a nurse or a fireman or a policeman could afford. And so that means that we don't have to subsidize the whole thing. And overall, I think the current uh, proposal would generate money to uh, give us an additional three to five units a year in the sustainable affordable housing sector. So Ellen, thank, uh, Aaron, thank you very much for the time. And when it, time is right, I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks so much, Rich. Um, you bring up some good points about what um, the Concord Affordable Housing Trust and your organization is um, looking to do. 
Um, as I had mentioned in the beginning of this presentation, um, the Arlington Affordable Housing Trust um, was adopted by town meeting um, this past fall. Um, and it, that when that board of trustees is appointed, um, they'll undertake a planning process relative to um, what their priorities and goals would be for you know, a five year horizon and um, being able to consider um, a range of opportunities because it's well capitalized will be um, a benefit to um, that trust fund um, and the board um, and the, the Arlington community. Um, so now I'd like to um, turn the presentation over to Ellen and Hannah to talk a little bit about the city of Somerville's experiences um, relative to this. And then um, I believe Hannah will give um, a preview of the, the coalition efforts to bring a local option or to establish a local option for um, Massachusetts cities and towns to um, accept. Um, it creates a simpler process than a home rule petition. Um, so uh, thanks, Ellen and Hannah, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Erin. And I, I wanted to just take one moment first to thank Pam Hallett, who's been a part of our coalition from the beginning, even before you guys had gotten to this point. And I want to thank Leonard and Erin now. I hope I'm not forgetting anybody for being a part of the coalition. Um, I just wanted to start by saying that, you know, I'm optimistic about this. And I'm optimistic about this because of tent cities and towns like Arlington, who are identify, continuing to identify the real estate transfer fee as one of the best um, one of the best ways to support local development of affordable housing. And as the number of cities and towns grow, I think that really will help us with our statewide enabling legislation um, and really will push together as a, as a you know, coalesce, as a force of municipalities together telling the legislature that this is something that's really important and that we need. So uh, there's some similarities to in the Somerville story and some differences from what you heard about Concord. Um, we started out, I myself sat on a group called the Sustainable Neighborhoods Working Group that was looking at a variety of options. It sounds a little bit like the Housing Plan Implementation Committee, but we were looking at ways to achieve affordability and sustainability in Somerville. Um, there were, Hannah would know better than me, she's the now coordinator, but about 10 main suggestions and the transfer fee being identified as one of the most important policy initiatives to come out um, recommendations to come out of that group. And then in 2000, December 2016, the mayor formed a task force specifically on the transfer fee. It had representatives on it from the Board of Aldermen, landowners, uh, affordable housing advocates, a representative from the Chamber of Commerce, etc. And I think one of the significant things that that group decided to do was to engage a consultant. Uh, we hired RK, RKG consultants to do a study for us to really look at first, how much money could we raise from the transfer fee? How much money could we raise if we had different assumptions with different exemptions and different applicability, right? So what do each of those policy options cost in terms of revenue? And I think really importantly to look at what impact would this be have if passed on the volume of real estate transactions, right? Because that's sort of the, the fear is that somehow fees will inhibit the growth and the development and the commerce in our cities. And I think um, they did a whole series of interviews with real estate professionals, looked at 10 years of um, data to determine this, and in the end really decided that they did not believe that a 1%, at that time it was a 1% real estate transfer fee, would have much impact at all on the scope and the scale of the speed of development within the city. And I think that that was a really important um, conclusion. Um, and then, uh, so some of the specific issues, and I'm sure this will come up with, with all of you, um, that came up at that point were, um, A, should it include commercial and residential sales? Should all of that money go into the trust fund for a period of time? There was some discussion about whether some of the commercial revenue should go into a small business fund. We opted against that in the end, in part because the Affordable Housing Trust Fund was an established mechanism for utilizing the money effectively and because housing was the number one priority. But we looked at that. We looked at exemptions, for instance, at the beginning, instead of 
identifying a threshold sale price, like Arlington is now doing at least with a minimum of the median sale price, we looked at different kinds of exemptions. Um, what would happen if we exempted longtime homeowners? So people that had owned their property for 10 years or more, 20 years or more. Um, we looked at um, exemptions for senior citizens. We looked at exemptions. Um, we talked a lot about what happens in a down market if you have a real estate transfer fee, right? So, and as, as this process developed, this report helped us to sort out what the benefits and the costs were of the different kinds of exemptions that we might um, establish. Um, in the end, in January of 2018, we had about a six month process with 10 hearings, not all with public testimony, um, but 10 hearings to get from our beginning petition to where we ended up. And they were substantially different. Um, the initial petition that we was filed before the, uh, the city council and the board of aldermen, um, was essentially a 1% fee pretty much across the board, but it tried to punt and say, we're not gonna decide what the exemptions are now. If the home rule legislation gets passed and we get authorization from the state to do this, then we're gonna come back and deal with the sort of the more sticky issues around what exemptions should be from this policy. Um, but there was a lot of testimony that, that came up and in the end, we adopted, we went from adopting a 1% across the board with no threshold to something a little different, which essentially ended up exempting all owner occupants and leaving the fee on investors, but doubled the amount of the fee from 1% to 2%, with 1% being borne by the seller and 1% being borne by the buyer. Um, so in the end, through this, we were able to generate almost the same amount of revenue, exempting owner occupants, but having, um, but having twice the level of, of a fee. Um, and we estimated a generation of between six and $10 million a year. And I do think it's important to say, obviously, that those seed funds can be used to leverage other funds, whether that's through bonding or whether that's as matching funds for state, federal, and other sources of funding for affordable housing. So it's a really significant amount of money, and we anticipate that being generated into a really significant amount of affordable housing um, in the end. Um, we did pass this unanimously, and I will say, as you might expect, there was a fair amount of opposition from small property owners, and I think there was a fair amount of distorted information that was being told to property owners about what this would mean. We did look at what the costs would be, and you know, there was at least at that time a 10% um, year over year sales price increase. So looking at 1% coming out of that was really a 10th of the profit that was being generated each year in that market. Um, so we really did see this as an equitable form of raising money um, for, you know, for affordable housing. Um, so now there is, there is this, uh, our petition is pending at the State House. We had it once for a short period in a prior session. We had it last year in session. Um, and I think what I would say, Hannah's going to talk about the enabling legislation, because I think that's really critical, building a statewide coalition, and she's going to talk about that. Um, but I do think that this year, as more and more cities and towns file home rule petitions, that it is easier for us as a group to lobby around passage of home rule petitions, whether or not enabling legislation is passed. So I will just say that I strongly support and I'm really excited to see Arlington engaging in this process. Um, and like uh, Rich, I'm happy to answer any questions that might come up. So, to Hannah. Great, thanks so much, Ellen. Um, Definitely, you know, you're speaking really, really well to the, the process that the home rule petition is. Um, and that's a big part of why we really are advocating for the enabling legislation. Um, obviously, it's no surprise to anybody here that, you know, the housing crisis is not just in one city or town. It's across the whole Commonwealth, country, world, what have you. Um, so part of why we really think it's critical to have this enabling legislation is because we do recognize that different cities and towns across the, the Commonwealth are in different positions, but this is a tool. And this is a tool that, um, you know, as, as Ellen and Rich have, have spoken to, that can generate a lot of money on a regular basis that can be used um, to preserve and create affordable housing that's really meaningful and purposeful. Um, so, 
you know, in keeping that in mind and keeping the purpose of this tool in mind, we want to make it as accessible as possible. And frankly, there are a lot of cities and towns that don't have necessarily the capacity for whatever reason to go through the home rule petition process, but that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be able to take advantage of this tool. Um, and, you know, for that reason, we do, you know, all of the home rule petitions really just add to the argument, but at the end of the day, the enabling legislation is really what's going to allow um, the, the change that needs to happen on a broader level, right? It's, it, you know, if just Boston does this, yes, that will be great for Boston. They'll generate a lot of money in Boston, but it's bigger than that. Um, and it's just really critical that, you know, we do have the support from across the Commonwealth. And we also think that, you know, it's, it's getting harder and harder to pass home rule petitions, but if all of our voices are united in this coalition, we have a much stronger position because it is, you know, a variety of cities and towns right now that need this. But there are also a lot of cities and towns that may not need it today, but you know, in five years, as, as prices begin to rise, we all missed the being able to take advantage of, of the, the flipping boom that happened and being able to capture some of that um, profit. But you know, places like Lynn, where they're kind of on the cusp of those increases, still have a chance to potentially capitalize on that and, and, and use those funds to, to shore up their, you know, their, their community. And that's really what our goal is so um, as Ellen and her spoke to the the coalition is um, actively growing we've been working on this for quite some time and it's been really great to have Arlington be so involved it's it's definitely been really really helpful to have Erin and Len and Pam um, you know help us in making this argument because we really do believe that this is you know a really powerful piece of legislation and we also um, believe that the power is with the municipalities. Your municipalities know what is best and know what your communities need. And this you know, requires a community process. And it's really important that this tool matches the needs of that community. And that's why the enabling legislation allows for municipalities to, first of all, they have to go through a public process, but they also can determine their own exemptions. So they have to go through that process with the community of figuring out how it will work for them. And the enabling legislation is, is set up in a way that all of the home rule petitions that are currently pending would absolutely be acceptable under the enabling legislation. So it's flexible, it's adaptable, and it is it's purposeful. And it's a tool that we see as having you know short term, really high need in obviously the places that have already filed home rule petitions, but also the need is going to continue to grow. And this is a long term tool that we really see as you know being able to to kind of prevent a lot of the gentrification that we've already, you know, seen that has had a huge impact on our communities and, and the folks that can live there and, and who can actually buy property. So the enabling legislation and the coalition itself is just um, our way of, of trying to make this as accessible as possible to any municipality that, you know, has the, the political will to take advantage of it. And, and not only that, but there are, you know, a few tangential benefits to having enabling legislation. So for example, um, you know, Worcester does not have an affordable housing trust fund. We had a great conversation with folks from Worcester and, you know, we kind of made the point that if this enabling legislation passed, maybe it would then be easier for a place like Worcester to get a, uh, an affordable housing trust also set up because there's a source of funding. Or it also allows, you know, for, um, you know, it, it can be leveraged for further advancement in terms of, of housing. So there's a lot, there's a lot of ways that this can be utilized. Um, and you know that just allowing any municipality to participate when and if they choose is really the crux of this. And it's, it's why it, it really can make a huge difference in municipalities in all different kinds of, of market situations. Sorry, that was a lot, but <laughs> so it's really, it's really critical and I'm really happy to be part of this work and, you know, it's just been really great to grow the coalition and I'm really excited to continue to do so. Thanks so much, Hannah and Ellen, um, for the perspective um, from Somerville and um, the information about the local option enabling legislation. Um, uh, if you if you are interested materials relative to the current um, home rule petition um, that would be ultimately provided to town meeting are available on the town's website. 
um, and, and links to the local option bills that were filed in the Senate and in the House are also linked there as well. Um, so I, I'll, I'll note that the um, home rule petition that will be um, forwarded to town meeting does track very closely to the local option as a way to, um, to tackle these, um, these topics that are meaningful to Arlington or some of the, the threshold decisions that Arlington may need to consider should the home rule petition be passed. Um, it's, it, it ensures that if the home rule petition um, is, is not passed and the local option is passed, um, the work is consistent and we are um, still on track to um, consider uh, a adoption of a real estate transfer fee. Um, I uh, will also note that um, the uh, select board and the finance committee, um, of course, have to review this article um, in advance of town meeting and they will be giving um, recommendations to town meeting. Um, so uh, I know the finance committee meeting is scheduled for March 17th. Um, so if uh, folks want to join us that evening and hear a little bit more, um, that, that is the night of our hearing. Um, and I, the select board meeting has yet to be scheduled at this point. Um, so with that, um, I am gonna thank our um, panelists um, for the time being, um, but also open it to um, questions and answers. Um, uh, if, if everyone would use the raise hand feature, um, I'll, uh, I'll go with that, but also try to watch people if they are waving their hand at me. Um, so the first hand I see is uh, Winnell Evans. Hi, good evening, Winnell Evans, Orchard Place. Um, thank you all so much. This is this is really interesting, and I'm I'm so excited that we're gonna get this underway in Arlington. And I have two questions. The first is just a clarification for me: if we're talking about instituting a fee on home sales above four hundred and forty-five hundred thousand dollars, is it only on the percent the portion of the sale above that amount? or is it on the entire amount of the sale for homes that sell for more than that amount? That's question number one. Uh, so Winnell, I can answer that easily. Yeah. It's um, the total sale price of sales that exceed that threshold. Um, so, okay, so, yep. so the first 445,000 is exempted in other words. Uh, nope, that's, um, um, sorry, I, I must, um, I'm not being clear. Um, it, it would um, be applicable to any sales that are equal to or greater than the 445, 500. Sales that are um, at a price point lower than that threshold would be exempt from the, the fee. Um, right. So, yep. Okay, okay. And then my other question is, and this is, this is a little bit aside from this, but last year there was money in the Community Preservation Act uh, the portion of it that is that is required to go to affordable housing for which there were no proposals made so that money was not allocated. And I believe that that happened again this year. And I'm wondering if we could possibly as a as an addendum to this amendment or a substitute motion or something, uh, get something in place so that if we have that leftover money in the CPA fund, it's just sort of automatically put into the trust fund. Would that be possible? I, I think that could be possible. Um, I don't think this is the right vehicle. This article would be the vehicle mm -hmm. for that. Um, uh, and certainly um, as we've mentioned or I've mentioned a few times, this, the home rule petition process is a long process. So in the interim, certainly um, the trust fund, the board of trustees could um, apply for funding through the CPA committee, particularly if they have reserves relative to affordable housing development. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Anel. Mm -hmm. um, next, I have Nancy. Hi, um, I have a question on um, the CPA and, and why it's kind of falling short by, um, in terms of um, providing for um, affordable housing since that surcharge has gone into place, um, 
why aren't those funds sufficient for affordable housing? So we're, we're you're you're proposing a real estate tax transfer tax because the CPA surcharge isn't working or it's falling short. Uh, no, I um, if I might, um, the uh, the real estate transfer fee is um, proposed to um, provide dedicated funding um, to the affordable housing trust fund, enabling the affordable housing trust fund to not compete for funding through the CPA committee or through the um, community development block grant um, funding sources that are available locally in town. Um, the uh, I, I um, can't speak to um, the CPA committee um, and their goals um, as I'm not a member of that. Um, but uh, perhaps I, um, perhaps our panelists might um, have some insight onto how these different um, funding sources of the fee, CPA, CDBG can all sort of contribute towards the development of affordable housing as mm -hmm. well as the preservation of affordable housing. I'm take that for a, for a second, uh, Aaron. Um, we have used CPA funding here, but you need um, a continuing organization with projects. So one of the, the two things I can speak of we've done recently, the Concord Housing Authority came in for money to build a small house on the fringe of land that the town had just uh, bought for a park, replacing a small house that it been within the park. So we had the housing authority there saying, after they had been pushed by affordable housing advocates here to use some of that land. So you had an organization to do it. Similarly, we have a uh, uh, housing development corporation uh, that has sought CPA funding over the years uh, to provide the town match on a large uh, affordable uh, senior living facility that's about to move forward. But part of the reason to have the money go into this trust fund is that many of these opportunities come up very quickly. Uh, we had one just recently where a owner was willing to sell at a reasonable rate, uh, but wanted to sell. Uh, as a result, the town with some of its affordable housing funds uh, that had been specifically appropriated uh, in anticipation of ultimately getting the transfer fee, the town's money, some money from the Concord Housing Foundation were used to buy the unit, which will become two affordable owner-occupied units developed by Habitat. But the lead process uh, that you need for the CPA doesn't work very well unless you've got an ongoing organization with a pipeline of projects. Whereas we like to think that hopefully there will be a pipeline, but the affordable housing and trust fund can use money from the transfer fee when other opportunities like the habitat property that I just described become available. Okay. And Aaron is, is um, thank you for that explanation, Frank. Um, is, is Arlington considering other exemptions outside of the median home price um, as um, Somerville has done? Um, or is that really the only exemption you're con is considering? Um, so uh, there are a number of exemptions um, in the Warren article. Um, they range from um, exempting transfers between family members um, to transfers between, um, you know, town and commonwealth jurisdictions. Um, it also includes an exemption on transfers of um, permanently restricted affordable housing um, so that that is not also contributing to the fee. Mm -hmm. um, there, the, so there's a range of exemptions, um, but, uh, but overall, all arm's length um, transactions would be subject to the fee. And I think um, Ellen had something else to jump in on, um, if that's okay, Nancy. Um, uh, sure. Okay. 
Thanks. Just very, yeah, just very quickly, I just did want to remind everybody that we did get to a place where we have this owner occupant exemption, but we have no threshold, right? We did that instead of, and I think that we decided for us that instead of picking a dollar figure, we wanted to look at who is it impacting and why. And I think that there's lots of different ways to look at these exemptions, but having a threshold is one that most cities and towns have looked at is what they've opted to do. Um, and, in, and again, as we started with no exemptions whatsoever, we ended up switching. I will say though that the RKG report did show, just, just to throw this out, that we did that um, when we, we looked at implementing an exemption for people that owned property over 10 years, and it ended up that it would have reduced the income that comes in by 50%. So just know that whenever you're talking about exemptions, you really have to think about, does it gut the provision it's so much that mm -hmm. you end up not having enough income generated to really make this multi-year process do what we need, what we need to do. And I just wanted to also add just very quickly on the last question, Somerville has both CPA and an affordable housing trust fund. And like Rich, I would say that the money that's in the trust, um, you know, go is, is really um, flexible, as Rich was saying, avail, able to be used really quickly. We have a program called the 100 Homes Program, where we buy up units that come up for sale on the market to try to keep tenants in their homes, to try to match affordable housing and anti-displacement as measures. And that affordable housing trust fund and the income, um, you know, that comes into that is so critical. And, you know, we just don't have enough money to continue to buy these units. And so we've generated 100 of these units over time, but we have an ambitious plan to try to do um, another, uh, well, the mayor just put out another 100 units um, a, a year, but that's probably very unrealistic. But, um, you know, I really, really know that we need a lot more money than generated from what is produced by CPA to have that kind of significant impact on the housing stock in our city. So. Okay. And if I could just jump in really quick back to the exemption question. Um, our final decision on our exemptions was really born out of the public process. So, um, you know, I, I just think it's really important to keep in mind that whatever exemptions you're thinking of now might change as you go through that process. And that's really a critical part of determining that and getting the approval. So it's just really critical to, to keep that in mind and, and keep an open mind about what is exempted and how. Yeah, I think that's a good example of why, you know, each town is different. Um, you couldn't have an owner uh, occupied exemption in Concord or there'd be no money in the fund. Because <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, there's almost no rental housing here, uh, except in existing affordable units or Concord Housing Authority units. So, you know, we couldn't exempt, uh, we couldn't exempt uh, owner occupied. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, so at the end, can you, would you mind putting up the screens again? Um, the intro screens on just the basic um, Yes, absolutely. Structure as it is now, yeah. Yeah, um, and for sure. And um, uh, if, if anyone didn't miss it at the beginning, I did announce that this is being recorded. Um, we, um, working with ACMI, will make this available, um, this recording available through the town meeting process. Um, it'll get posted on the town's website. And um, those couple of slides that I had shown at the very beginning, I will post on the town's website as well. Um, so thank you so much. Um, uh, Patricia Warden, member of the Housing Plan Implementation Committee. Thank you. And I find what Francie said very interesting. When I was chair of the Arlington Housing Authority, um, I, uh, there were times when we wanted to purchase something, but we couldn't move quickly enough. We couldn't get the money fast enough because of a lot of governmental restraints. So our, our solution was, um, it was a fairly good solution, but not ideal, um, since we didn't have an affordable housing trust fund of any kind to, to draw on for money, um, was to help reestablish a defunct um, nonprofit called the Housing Corporation of Arlington. And we helped them get established by providing at cost renovations for properties that they bought and renovated as affordable and used for affordable housing that has worked reasonably well 
um, because the Housing Corporation works hard on it. Um, but it, I, I, um, I can't emphasize enough how, how much an affordable housing trust fund would mean for Arlington and the home rule petition um, that we have uh, is ideal for funding such a, a, a trust. Um, I would like to ask Ms. Frank Feely um, what kind of eligibility uh, constraints uh, or guidelines they have for their affordable housing trust fund because we do not really have an affordable housing trust fund. We have a housing, we have a housing trust fund, but our eligibility criteria are allow people with um, families with six figure incomes, 100% of um, AMI to um, access affordable housing trust funds so that if in fact, the um, home rule petition were successful and we were to file a bylaw um, uh, at town meeting um, for approval, we should first of all, make sure that we amend, I think, our, our affordable housing trust fund. What do you think, Mr. Mr. Feely? Um, don't you, do, what do you think about eligibility criteria for access? Um, if in fact we get have a, a very handsome, we would have an extremely handsome flow of money if in fact the home rule petition gets anywhere. Um, so what do you think about eligibility criteria? Can you give us some advice from your experience in Concord? Well, um, we have uh, the committee, but it hasn't been appointed yet. So um, obviously um, there are the state criteria and I'm not an expert on those, on you know, what constitutes affordability. Uh, until we actually get the uh, committee appointed, there are some rules in place about what the select, you know, what they can do in the select board approval of certain kinds of purchases. But the kind of policy that you're talking about, what will we spend money on and who can, who can live there or who can buy there, um, that we haven't gotten to yet. Um, my personal feeling is that we not only need to deal with the more conventional uh, definition of affordability, uh, but we're gonna have to in Concord deal with workforce housing and some form of subsidy for that, probably with an income limitation uh, on the resale, but Frankly, I, you know, I don't, it's not just a question of whether the nurses in Emerson can buy in town. I doubt a young doctor in town can buy now. Uh, but those are policies that will have to be set after the committee's, committee's appointed. We don't have a committee yet. Thank you. Ellen, did you have something to add? Just something quickly to add um, from the experience in Somerville, just to note. So by state stat by state statute, it's limited. Um, for rental housing to 100% of, of area median income, and then the local decisions are: do you want to further target it below below that? But what I did want to just say, interestingly, is we did develop an, for our inclusionary housing policy higher tiers to meet what was perceived as the middle income need that went up as high as 110% for area median income. But what we've actually found is that the demand for units at that really high level in the, um, in the affordability program just is not there anywhere to the extent relative to what programs that are targeted at ideally 80% or less, or at least no more than 100% or less, because we're really finding that there's very little demand at that amount that was looking to be middle, what we would call middle income housing. So just wanted to share that, that from our perspective, 80 or 90 being the top at the rental housing seems to be what generally works out in, the, in terms of the market to have significant demand. And just to wrap up, of course, the Board of Trustees would develop that action plan. The, um, there's the flexibility for a wide range of um, household sizes and household incomes um, in the bylaw. Um, and to be through a public process, the Board of Trustees, once they're appointed in Arlington, could um, narrow in on specific needs that are grounded in the community. Um, so Jonathan Nyberg, also a member of the Housing Plan Implementation Committee. First of all, I wanna say thank you so much for joining us tonight, Ellen, Rich, and Hannah. Really appreciate the input and also your willingness to share your expertise and your time. 
Uh, thank you, Ellen. We've been focusing primarily on sellers and I really like the concept of including buyers. One is exiting a community who's possibly made them a lot of equity and the other one's entering a community to create a better community. So I think it's actually genius to split that and have both parties contribute. Um, one is a thank you, we're leaving. And the other one is, you know, hello, we're coming. So I think that's genius. And my only thing, which I've said before, I think it's imperative, especially as much as we want to protect people who maybe have houses less than a certain price point. I think it's imperative not to create uh, a potentially negative bias. I think it's more important to unify the community. Everybody participated in, everybody participated out. And I think it creates a better sense of inclusion than uh, uh, wealthy versus poor bias or something. So if everybody participates, we've all contributed, whether you're selling it for 200,000 or 2.5 million. So I, I try to make no assumptions of other people's money. And I think it makes for a better community from my perspective. So thank you again for joining us and sharing your expertise. It's really valuable, thanks. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, Karen Kelleher, uh, another member of our Housing Plan Implementation Committee and town meeting member. Hi, Erin, thanks so much. And I echo Jonathan's gratitude um, to all of our speakers. My question for you as we try to sort of get our arms around what, where our attention should be focused as we enact a, a trust fund and try to fund it is how much per, has the per unit subsidy cost been for you for a variety? I realize there's a range, there's no one answer to this, but could you give folks a sense for how much subsidy you've needed to provide or raise with your local funds or other funds for each unit that you produce? And does that vary across unit types and who you're serving? There's a lot of interest in, in creating very low income housing in Arlington. And it would be, I think, really helpful if you could speak to some of the strategies and, and resources you've brought to the table to be able to create that, because I think we need to start thinking about the resources that would help us to achieve those goals. Thank you. Rich or Ellen, no? Well, um, I wish I could answer that. Um, you know, it obviously depends on square footage. It depends on the, the density you can build on the land you acquire. Um, and, you know, I can give you a couple of examples uh, here. The small house that's being built for the Concord Housing Authority, uh, they got 300000 for that from the Community Preservation Act. I think it's going to cost a little bit more. Um, I'm not quite sure where this, how, you know, how the two houses coming out of the building that was bought with Habitat will work. I mean, that one's an interesting one because uh, those people are going to be owner occupiers and paying a mortgage. And so some money will come back from that. Uh, I think there are just so many variables. It's hard to say. Um, Concord certainly has built over the last 20 years, a number of uh, units, um, but I'm not sure how much the construction cost of those uh, is predictive of what it'll cost now. Um, so I think the answer is I wish I could give you more guidance, but I can't. Um, oh, sorry, go ahead, Ellen. Um, I, no. I yes. Yeah. You go, uh, please. Okay. Um, so the the staff on uh, another matter did some research on development costs, total development costs um, in the greater Boston area. Um, it's it's obviously largely determined by market forces, um, but in recent years, it's averaged about two hundred and five dollars per square foot nationally. Um, and in greater Boston, um, cost ranged from um, about $219 per square foot for for-profit housing developers 
to about $255 per square foot for nonprofit housing developers. So you can see that there's a, a difference of about, um, well, I can't do math that quick, $35, I think, um, that uh, needs, that it just shows that it's that much more expensive um, to, to create and build and construct um, affordable housing. Um, so, uh, so that information is out there, um, and but of course it depends um, year over year with market cost, uh, yeah, market um, driven costs, and and certainly um, COVID has been changing supply chains and um, co and construction costs in um, over the last year or so. Mm. Yeah, I think it's also inevitable that smaller units that are affordable will have higher per square foot cost because you're amortizing all of the infrastructure over fewer square feet. I mean, there's a reason that the developers want to build these 5,000 square foot monsters because they're more profitable. I, I just want to clarify my question a little bit. I think that's all really interesting. I was trying to get at how much subsidy is needed because some portion of that cost can be covered by the rent paid or the purchase price paid by the buyer or the renter, but it, it varies depending on income levels. So as we think about how much money do we need to raise and how many units are we gonna get from that? There's a lot of variables, but there's a range and it, it'd be helpful to hear some real, just some actual um, ex experiences from these adjacent communities. Hannah, I don't know, I was just gonna, I had a, something slightly different to say, but neither Hannah or I are the ones that actually do the housing development. So I know those numbers are available and if it would be helpful, we can talk to Mike Filoni the director of the housing division and try to get some of that, those numbers for you. I, I will say though that, that, you know, obviously many deals cannot be done without a number of different funding sources. You all know that tax credits, other funding sources. And what we have found is that we have not, the units we have developed for the most part through these dollars have been at 60% of area median income or higher. And to the extent, as you were saying, that people are really interested in targeting at that lowest income bracket, right now we're looking at things like, can we convince the housing authority to project base some more of those subsidies into the new development so that we can reach further down in the eligibility scale, right? So I think um, that that's, it's a big challenge all, all around to try to get units to, to the depth of affordability that we want them that don't have permanent long-term subsidy, deep subsidies. Um, but there are creative, there are creative means and we'd be happy to try to get some information on the subsidy numbers for you. Great. That's great, thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, Stephen, Stephen B. Uh, thank you, a couple of comments, okay? Yes, absolutely. Right. Um, a house is worth what it's worth. So whatever the um, percentage is, it's going to come out of the seller, regardless of how you distribute it. It's less money going to the seller of the house. And over time, regardless of where it starts, the amount will go to 2%. In good times, you'll say, well, now that we can increase the rate. In bad times, we will now we need the money or it's a good opportunity to buy. And then that 1% for the developers, if they're operating on a 20% margin, 1% fee is 5% of their profit. If they operate on 10%, then it's 10% of their profit. And there should be tighter language on what it can be used for. For example, the article says supporting affordable housing. What does support mean? Um, for example, rent subsidies become lost money that could otherwise be used for purchasing property. And I was looking at the proposed state home rule language and it allows personnel and other costs. So then because it's not strict language, you, the town could load other personnel costs into the trust. So just be aware of, I call fudgy language. Um, if the units become town owned, then it's a growing maintenance cost and the maintenance cost could end up overwhelming the amount of money coming in and, and each year is less and less available for purchase. Uh, those are my comments, thank you. Thank you. Um, they are, um, 
they are good points. Um, again, the uh, the board of trustees and working with um, the select board would be putting together the um, the action plan for the affordable housing trust. Um, the affordable housing trust doesn't um, have any funding as of yet, um, so. I, that will be a public process, um, as will the development of, um, you know, should the home rule petition be approved by the legislature, there'll be a public process or additional public process related to that. Um, so I think that there'll be a lot of time over the next, uh, you know, year or so to be able to um, narrow in on these details, um, you know, that that have uh, community support. Um, Topher, um, I'm going to, I'm just going to stop there. I am. It's yeah. pronounced I am. Thank you. Um, thank you for having this. My question is just coming back to the amounts. Why the range of 0.05% to 2%? That's a 40x range. Yep. Um, so the range um, is established um, to give some flexibility. Um, I think as part of the conversations with uh, the um, select board and the finance committee, there might be the opportunity to narrow in on that. Um, th the range, um, as you point out, does provide quite a difference of funding on the, on the lower end. Um, it is, it could be um, uh, about $225,000 um, based on the 2020 sales data that I received from the assessing office. Um, upwards of nine million dollars on the higher end. Um, so I, I think that that number can be refined through the process. But um, at the time, at this time, um, we are proposing the range um, to to give that flexibility. Um, it also tracks pretty closely to the um, local option and other home rule petitions. Um, maybe Hannah or Ellen can speak to why that range is also included in the local option legislation. Yeah, sure, if, if um, Ellen, feel free to, to add, but I, you know, it, it, part of um, our thinking behind the way that the enabling legislation has been crafted is to, to allow for municipalities to figure out what works for them best. Um, so in Somerville, that was 1% on each side, but we recognize that, you know, in different markets, so like in Nantucket, for example, half a percent in Nantucket is going to go a long way when their average sale price is, you know, one or $2 million. So I think it, it's just another way to allow municipalities to tailor this, um, this tool to their actual market. And, and you know, it, it's also, um, there's an element of, of working with property owners and making sure that, that people are comfortable with what you're proposing. And, um, you know, we did get a lot of pushback on the higher end of 2%. So, you know, there's, it's another way to, to compromise and to make sure that, that everybody's kind of on board. Aaron, just a point of clarification, the statewide language is one half of 1% to 2%, not 0.05%. So it's a four to one range in the state language. I don't know what you've got in your town draft, but that's the state language. Yep, it, um, the, the Warren article does go down to uh, 0 0.05. Um, so it's a, it's a little bit lower than the, um, the enabling legislation. Um, Topher, did you have a follow-up question? No, that was it, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Nandana, I'm sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly. That's okay. Uh, thank you for, thank you for, um, oh, there we go. Thanks for, oh my God. I'm sorry about the screen. This is my, my sixth graders computer I'm using. Um, so I have uh, uh, just a couple of questions. <coughs> I think Ellen, you mentioned that in Somerville, there were alternatives that uh, the town considered to uh, this tax. Did Arlington consider uh, similar options? Or other options, and how did how did we narrow it down to to this particular one? Um, so we're conti we're continuing to consider other options. Um, uh, this, as has been pointed out, um, this is one of the tools that can create a sustaining and renewable um, source of funding for the affordable housing trust. But certainly, there are other options within the community to fund um, the affordable housing trust, whether that's an application to the CPA committee 
or um, asking or requesting um, community development block grant funds. Um, there are ways to tailor our inclusionary zoning um, for uh, fees to go into the Affordable Housing Trust and then other sort of um, other revenues um, that I had uh, mentioned, at, I think, at the top of the hour um, relative to um, to marijuana fees or to short-term rentals. So, so there's a number of ways that um, the trust could be uh, funded. And um, this, this, this option has a, has a pretty long lead time, as I had mentioned. So I think um, the, the goal was to get this underway and then to, to consider those other options for sure um, and, and um, move forward from there. Of course, um, the, as I had mentioned a couple of times, the, the Board of Trustees for the Trust Fund um, could consider those other options that have um, you know, quite a shorter, shorter lead time um, and potentially just an application um, to one of our fellow committees. Thank you. And my second question is, what is the effect have the, um, that we've seen on the housing market in the rest of the town? once something like this is passed? Like, does it lead to increase in housing prices for, you know, which in terms of affordability, uh, then kind of dilutes the whole point, of, you know, the whole issue? Yeah, um, if I could ask our um, panelists, um, Ellen had referenced a report that RKG Associates had completed for the city um, that um, she, could, she could speak to that, that expertise that was, went into that report. And it looked like Rich had something to add as well. So the report, I mean, just so because we don't have a transfer fee, right, we can't speak to empirical evidence of what happened once it was implemented. And um, in that, but in that report, which we're happy to also share with you, they did conclude that based on series of interviews, based on data gathering, et cetera, that, that their professional opinion, I can't, I really can't say exactly everything they did to come to that decision right now, but was that it would have a pretty negligible impact on sales. Just to note that something that's come up over time is, you know, realtors ch often charge, right, four or five, it used to be even higher percent on sales. And while there's often a lot of opposition, those, those fees have not sort of collapsed the real estate industry. And CPA, to the best of our knowledge, has not had a significant detrimental impact on the volume of sales or sales price, you know, or, or a huge inflationary impact on sales prices. It's so hard to separate things out. As you know, prices are going so high all the time that to really be able to tease out, let's say, what was the impact of a CPA on that is incredibly, is incredibly difficult. Um, but prices are, are rising at somewhat equal rates, despite whether or not it appears whether or not people have any of these um, related fees. So RKG did come to the conclusion it would have a ne negligible impact on unit prices and on development rates, but we're happy to share the report with you. But I haven't read it in, I haven't read it in detail in, quite in a little while. <laughs> it's been a few years. Ellen's right. There's no example of a transfer fee for housing, but there is an example in the state of a transfer fee for open space. And as far as I can tell, there's no evidence that the real estate markets in Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, and uh, Barnstable County have grown uh, slower than the rest of the state. Sure, there's a demand there, uh, and that's why they did it. Uh, but the fact is, if the demand is there, uh, it's pretty clear that uh, in those cases, I think it's 2% uh, go into the uh, conservation fund um, there's no evidence that that's held that market back. And just the one thing I would add to that, because we did do some research to the extent that a fee was put on the buyer and you spread out over time what the impact of that would be over the life of a 20 or 30 you know, year mortgage, it was incredibly small. Um, and so we were able to, when we were determining how to, and I, how to you know, how to allocate that fee, that was one of the things that we looked at was that it was almost negligible in the overall context of the rates of sales we were talking about and what kind of monthly payments would have to be made to absorb it. Because obviously we're concerned about prices going up and not wanting to hurt people trying to come into the market. But when you can amortize it, it really has a negligible impact. And can I just- It sounds like it, it, it comes down to how, you know, that the devil is in the details, right? How this is really implemented to the past and sort of the constraints around. Thank you very much. Thank you so no. much.
I'm, I'm sorry, can I just um, comment on the real estate taxes, I mean, the real estate commission and um, the expenses to sellers? Because Massachusetts has a documentary stamps, ta stamps tax for sellers, which is really synonymous with a transfer tax. So, you know, the sellers being hit with that, that from the state, $4.56 per thousand dollars on the sale price. In Barnstable County, it's higher. It's six dollars and twenty cents per um, per thousand. Then they've got the re the Realtors um, Commission, and now this proposal of um, a transfer tax on a local level, um, two percent is um, quite high. Um, I mean, that's that's a lot of burden on the um, the seller, um, and, and as Somerville has. Um, kind of worked out. I mean, it, it, it does seem like it would be more equitable to, sh to share that, that cost. Yep, um, that is a good point there. You know, purchasing and is a home is not um, an inexpensive proposition in the greater Boston area. And um, with additional uh, fees added on to it, um, it, 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 you know, can, um, can make it a reach for a lot of families. Um, but I think um, relative to the home rule petition in Arlington, um, I, we, I think it provides sort of a equitable um, uh, uh, request in terms of um, what had been mentioned earlier is that it's, uh, it applies to all community members um, in the community um in the same fashion um and again this if the home rule petition is passed by the legislature um you know the arlington community will need to vote on this through a ballot um so so there is a lot of work to be done um relative to a public process and really um sussing out the the needs of the community um and what actually works for arlington Uh, Nancy, do you have um, another question? Um, you had had your hand up um, earlier. No, sorry, that was it was just about the documentary stamps tax that's great. that's already in existence. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, yeah, there's a couple um, more people with hands up. Um, I just want to check if there are folks that haven't had a chance to speak. Um, or ask a question um, if if there are. Um, otherwise, we'll uh, we'll take these last two questions and then wrap up for the evening. Um, so uh, I'll give some folks a, a moment to um, to find the raise hand feature. Okay. Um, so uh, Patricia, for the the second time. Patricia, you, yep, Hi, there you go. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Just a very quick comment. Um, I just wanted to say that over the years, Arlington has been extremely generous with its community development block grant funds. This won't be of interest to Frank Feely, but it might be to Ellen Charter. We have um, literally given millions of dollars of CDBG money for affordable housing. Um, and we, um, if, if we in, indeed do uh, obtain a, a good bylaw with, for a transfer tax, um, real estate transfer tax, it would alleviate the, the burden on the CDBG funds so that we can, we can use them for other pressing needs. I have really felt bad over the years as a town meeting member and whatnot to be uh, seeing the CDBG list of um, awards where they really gave crumbs, just crumbs, to very worthy endeavors of volunteer groups and others in town. So it would release C those CDBG funds for very worthy causes. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, Jonathan? Sorry, sorry about that. Yeah, I just wanted to say, so I am a realtor, I'm a flipper, I'm an investor, and I'm a risk taker in Arlington. And I think I have multiple apartment units, so I provide apartment housing, I help provide housing for people 
uh, at different levels, different price points. And I'm also working with investment into the, the town. I think that if we can, as hard as it is to have money quote taken away from anybody, it's also an investment in our community and in our future. You know, and maybe we don't fully understand affordable housing, but it could be a fireman, it could be a teacher, it could be somebody else that also contributes to our community that would like to live in our community. So as painful as it may seem to pay an extra couple, two, five, ten thousand dollars at closing, again, I think if you split it between the buyer and seller, you have a buyer who's investing in the future of the community and the seller who actually probably got more than they would have gotten another community if we didn't have such a great community. So I think it's, I think it makes sense. And then it also will definitely help us with affordable housing because it's very expensive, you know, and how do we create a balanced community without some of this housing? So anyway, I just want to again, thank you for your input tonight. Thanks. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, and last but not least, Stephen. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to talk about at the margin, this 1% or realtors fees or any extra costs, there are unseen people who are excluded because that raised cost it moves them into where they can't afford the house. So these costs do not have um, free ride for people. And then again, as I mentioned, there's no split of the costs. The house doesn't become 1% more valuable because you have a transfer tax. It's worth what it's worth and it comes out of what the seller gets ultimately. And I'd just like to thank Patricia Warden for her decades of work for Arlington. That's it, thank you. Thank you. Can, uh, Jonathan. Can, can I just interject real quickly? So as a realtor on the front line, honestly, this is not gonna detract people from moving to our, con our community and it's not gonna dissuade people from selling a property. So I think that's just the honest reality and um, I contribute more probably than anybody on this board every year to this, uh, to this tax. So just putting my two cents in. So it's, it's not gonna affect anybody. Arlington's a great community. Somerville's a great community. I have rental property in Somerville. Concord's fabulous. So it's just the reality of living in a good community, period. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I guess last but not least, Annie, um, uh, thank you for raising your hand. So I, I just did want to comment on sort of the other sources of funding that we have for affordable housing that I'm familiar with, which is CPA funds and CDBG. Um, so the CDBG funds that we receive are about a million dollars a year, maybe a little bit more. And those funds we are required to spend in particular categories and we max out each of those categories. So we would not have more money in CDBG to spend on some of the worthy causes that Patricia mentioned because we're maxing out the amount of money we're allowed to spend in that category. Um, but we might be able to redirect some of the houses, some of the funding in the area of housing that we're spending now to something slightly different if we had the transfer fee and we didn't need it to support the development of new affordable units. Um, I, I'd have to go back and look at the rules to know exactly what that would be. And similarly with the CPA, we have the same problem that Concord has, which is that the CPA can grant money on an annual cycle to a project, but they can't put money into the trust fund to be used on a flexible basis. And the real reason that this trust fund and funding this trust fund is so important is because we can make decisions as projects come up step by step. And we don't have to wait until a funding cycle, which both CPA and the CDBG are subject to. Um, thank you so much for those points. Um, it's a great uh, way to end the evening. Um, and I'll just, I'll reiterate the fact that the um, Affordable Housing Trust um, will be able to act more nimbly um, than the regular funding cycle um, with town meeting um, and, and be able to provide additional funds to the community for these worthy causes, not only affordable housing, um, but the, the preservation and development of it. 
Um, so uh, with that, um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us this evening. Um, I, uh, uh, I, um, sorry, the, the, um, the recording will be um, made available through ACMI. It will likely be early next week when it does become available. I will post my slides um, that I had on the Housing Plan Implementation Committee's page on the town's website. Um, and the video will get posted there as well. And we'll circulate some of this information through the town's um, social media channels and other communication channels. Um, but um, with that, um, I really want to thank our panelists, Rich Feely, Ellen Schachter, and Hannah Carrillo for joining us this evening. Um, and the, the representation from the various boards and committees um, and town meeting members um, that joined us this evening. Thank you so much for taking you know, um, just under an hour and a half out of your evening. Um, really appreciate it. Um, with that, um, I will, if, if there is interest, um, I can put up the slides um, again. Um, but again, those will be posted. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us this evening. I hope everyone has a great evening. Thanks, thank Sarah. you so Thanks much for having us. Thanks, Sarah. Great job.